Hi everyone. Um, I hope you had a good week and I hope you are excited for the weekend. I certainly am. Get to spend time with my family, um, which is reason to give worship. So we'll, we'll talk today, but first I want to ask you if you have ever heard of the term virtual signaling. I feel like it's a term that has been used a lot lately, um, mostly in the political setting or in political discussion. It's just, it just gets flinged around a lot. So what does it mean? You know, spiritual signaling, according to an Oxford definition, is the action or, or practice of expressing an opinion publicly for the sake of showing I have a good character, but associated with it is a lack of substance, you know? It was actually a British term coined by a guy named James Bartholomew. He was referring to a social media trend of sharing opinions online primarily for the purpose of convincing other people of their own, of their own goodness. Um, so it's used to refer to people that want to show support for a cause or want to show uh, that they have virtue or that they believe the right thing without actually doing anything about it. Um, and this term is only a few years old, but I think it really is a, is a behavior that has existed for a long time, maybe in a slightly different angle. So in, the, in Italian, we have this word that um, it's kind of a weird word, but um, it's been around for a long time, at least. Uh, definitely heard it by the age I was 10. And if we pretend I'm 29, uh, that's 19 years. So it's a little more than that, but not that much more. Um, but it's a word that means it's, it's perbeniz, perbenismo, which means comes from perbene, which uh, means to do things the right way. Um, so, and it's an ism, so it's like saying to do the right weightism. Um, but the whole point is it's, it's basically paying lip service. It's, 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 it's like acting like I'm virtuous without being virtuous. So very interesting, really. But I think this behavior is even older. I think if we look at this passage today, we have an instance that occurred almost exactly 2,000 years ago, probably about a decade off, but probably almost the right time of year because it happened just before Passover and we're kind of just before Passover. Um, so, yeah, so we'll see. And you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about. And we'll, we'll break it down. Um, but I'm reading today from John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. So starting from verse one, this is what it says. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Bit of virtual signaling there maybe. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Wow, Judas. Talk about being off the mark. So today we're going to look at this passage and we're going to see how there are two very different responses from, um, to Jesus as believers. In the person of Judas and in the person of Mary, because they are very much in contrast here. Yes, I'm classing Judas as a believer. Obviously, I'm using the term somewhat loosely, and obviously because he betrays Jesus in the end. 
And we might be tempted to judge Judas uh, because we know that of him. But we have to look at the reality. Judas was one of the 12 apostles. Um, he, at this point, had been following Jesus for three years. Um, you know, he, he was present for the whole of Jesus' ministry and was with him for the whole of Jesus' ministry. So he wasn't someone that was on the fringe. In fact, this passage tells us he was essentially the treasurer. Now, who do we appoint in a position of treasurer? Do we appoint Messiah betrayers or do we appoint people that we think are trustworthy with money? Of course, it's people we trust. Then we have accounts of the Last Supper where it indicates that J Judas is sitting next to Jesus um, at the table, which also could potentially indicate closeness. It could also indicate that he pushed himself there. If my cousin at our wedding had the boldness to move the name tags so he could sit where he wanted, Judas could have pushed himself <laughs> to be sitting next to Jesus. My point is, Judas wasn't the last of Jesus' disciples. He wasn't someone that was like on the fringe, vaguely partaking or observing the, the phenomenon. At least at the beginning, he's, he seems to be in it. You see, this is why Judas' fall is so great. Because he came from a high place. He was close to Jesus. He was one of the 12. He has a place of honor. Um, and he falls so badly. He got lost along the way. The point I'm trying to make here is that we must refrain from judging Judas as I would never be that guy because that's just not how life is. Judas, you know, being a believer doesn't preclude you from having the wrong attitude, from misunderstanding Jesus, for, from forgetting the significance of his message or not really understanding or having the wrong focus. Those things are not necessarily prevented from just, you know, being part of a church. That happens. So it's important that we don't judge Judas, but we can still look at him with an analytical mind as an example of basically what not to do. Um, you know, we can, we can learn from Judas's mistake as believers. To give the context of the passage, Jesus recently raised Lazarus from the dead. And the authorities, if you were with us last week, you know, they issued a warrant for Jesus' arrest. They decided they're going to kill him, right? Because he's gaining popularity. So lots of people believe. So it's not a, yeah, it, it, the, the jury is not still out about Jesus. Um, so they're at a dinner in Jesus' honor. Um, it's not... Lazarus' family that holds the dinner most likely is someone else. Other gospels report a guy called Simon the leper. So, so he's obviously made a dent in Bethany after raising Lazarus. Um, and they hold a, Jesus in his honor, a, a dinner in his honor. And Mary pours this crazy expensive perfume on Jesus. And we see Judas' heart in his reaction. Judas shames Mary's action. You see, the perfume was not his. It wasn't a common good. It wasn't something they were holding to, to sell to give to the poor. Yet he feels entitled to, to look at Mary and judge her action. And what's even more shameful, he uses the poor as an excuse to justify himself. Most likely, he thinks he is right. You know, besides where his heart is, Besides being a thief, sometimes, you know, people struggle with their sin, but they might still think that what they said was legitimate, that it had the legitimate value. After all, it's in the law. Deuteronomy 15, 11 says, Therefore I command you, you shall open, your wide, open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, to the poor in your land. So he's, he's thinking, I have the moral high ground. This is why I'm thinking he's virtue signaling or something similar. In other words, Judas is being judgmental towards Mary. He's missing the significance of the act and he has the wrong focus and he's judging Mary and thinks he knows better. 
I mean, who, who hasn't been guilty of this? One easy example of this is marriage, right? It's, you know, especially as believers, I think this is possibly particularly hard because we, we all know what Christian virtue is. We all know how a spouse should behave, you know? And it's easy to get caught up in telling your spouse, oh, you should be like this. Well, look, it's, I can point to scripture and, and, uh, and show you how you're supposed to be more patient, how you're supposed to serve me. Um, it's easy to get caught up in that, and it never goes well. We also have a huge industry of reality shows. I personally hate reality shows, but I feel like that's kind of the, the basis on which they exist, so we can judge the people in the shows, we can judge their decisions, we can judge their actions, we can judge what they do. See, I think being judgmental is a real temptation for Christians. And, and, and there's a reason why. I'm not justifying being judgmental, but I think it's important to understand where it's coming from. You see, we have a focus on sanctification. We believe that virtue is important. We believe that um, righteousness is important. So, you know, we, we have a focus on fighting sin and living righteously. So this is our mindset. And I think being judgmental is this mind and gone askew. Um, and, and this mindset is focused on behaving rightly, behaving in a way to honor God, it has a risk of leading us to be self-righteous if we think we're doing it and judgmental towards others if we think they're not doing it. You know, if we think of ourselves as sinners, we might not be so quick to judge others. But if we think of ourselves, huh, I'm doing pretty well, that's what happens. You see, we forget that everything is by grace. You see, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift from God. It's dangerously easy to forget that, to become complacent and forget that. Jesus has many interactions with the Pharisees. And we know the Pharisees as these hypocritical people, and we know them as these people that just completely missed the mark. But that's not really the full truth about the Pharisees. From the, their perspective, there has been hundreds of years without a prophet, hundreds of years without God's revelation. The Pharisees were people that came together to purify the land. This is what happens a lot in the Old Testament. We purify the land, we purify our beliefs. That's what prophets do. They come in and they correct people. And that's what they're doing. That's why we put this, they put on these other rules because they think if we respect these other rules, we'll be even more righteous. And they want people to respect the rules because they care for the nation. We see in this, when they discuss in the passage from last week, you know, they, they, they don't want, they, they want their nation to prosper. They want their, their nation to be righteous. And they got lost along the way. They became hypocritical because it became only about the rules. That's why we have a risk as Christians to be, to be Pharisaic. And my whole life, especially in Italy where, where the Catholic Church is a, it's, um, it's mainstream, excuse me, my insulin pump has decided to beep. Um, in Italy, and, and everywhere, you know, that's the first thing. When people dislike Christians, that's the thing they say. They're judgmental. So it's a, it's a risk we need to be aware of. But there's more, you see. John tells us that it isn't just that he was misunderstanding the action of Mary. It isn't just that he was thinking he was better. It wasn't just that he was thinking um, we should do something else with this resource. No, he was a hypocrite. He, he was, he told, Jim tells us that Jesus was a thief, a thief. He was only saying this because he was greedy and he would be profiting. You know, if the money goes in the bag, there's something in it for him. Going back to the marriage illustration, you know, I can tell my wife, love is patient, love is kind. And I can say it because I need you to be patient for, towards me. I need you to be kind towards me. It's, it's just hypocrisy. When, especially when we do something because it affects me. We want other people to act differently because it affects me. 
But just in general, you know, who, who else is a judgmental hypocrite? Me. You know, I, I, when I hear of conflict, I always think, ah, you know, my advice is always, you should be more graceful. And that is the truth. You should be more graceful. You should be more graceful. I should be more graceful. Judy should be more graceful. Everyone should be more graceful. Sorry to pick on you. <laughs> but, it, but there's always this hypocrisy. You know, I can tell uh, someone comes to me, you know, a friend says, I have this problem with this coworker. I'm thinking, you got to allow, make allowances. That's what we're called to. And then I get in my car, and I think that every single person cannot drive. And they must be blind. They must be selfish. They must be other things not so kind to say. Um, it's something that, you know, we're all at risk to do. And it's something that takes us away from the right response to Jesus. You see, through his response to Mary's action, Judas betrays this, the place of his heart. Uh, he betrays a focus that is not on Jesus. And it betrays a judgmental attitude. And we know that God looks to the heart. So that's what we really need to be careful of. But what is Jesus' response to Judas's objection? Jesus rebukes Jesus. He basically quotes the law back to him. You know, the, the verse I read, therefore I command you, open your hand, feed the poor. Jesus, the, Jesus quotes the first few sentences before then, essentially paraphrasing, you know, saying, because the verse says, for there will never be, there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, open your hand and give it to the needy. Jesus is saying, you will have, always have the poor in the land. You can always help them and you should but I'm only here for a short time. That is significant. That indicates priority. And we'll look at more why Mary's action is significant. What I find interesting, in, particularly in Jesus' response, is that he doesn't call out Judas' hypocrisy. You know, John tells us his motive, and I'm sure Jesus knows it, right? Jesus is the Son of God. He He's, he, he regularly shows to know what people's hearts are like. He already knows that Jesus is going to betray him long before he betrays him. Of course, Scripture and Jesus condemns his behavior all the time. You know, the, the classic plank in the eye. You know, do not point to someone's splinter in their eye when you have a whole plank in it. And Judas has a whole sawmill in his, in his eye. Um, but I think he's trying to place emphasis on Mary's reaction. The, 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 his Mary's act of worship. It is, because it, it's, it's a really, it's a really good response. It's, it's the right response. And it's really important. And what's interesting is Matthew and Mark also um, report this event. And this is what they say. Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is Jesus' words reported in the other gospels. But the other gospels don't report her name. The other gospels that predate John, so her name hadn't been written down, but they're saying she will be remembered. And it's true, she is remembered. We don't know why they omitted the name. There could be a number of reasons, could be to protect her. But they're right, she is remembered. We're remembering her right now, and we're gonna talk about her and what she did right now. Just a couple of facts about Mary. Mary was also close to Jesus. Her brother was Lazarus and had just been resurrected by Jesus. So they're at this dinner. At this dinner, this banquet given for Jesus, and they're reclining. Her sister's serving. And what does Mary do? Mary takes a really expensive perfume. It's 300 denarii. A denarii 
Sorry, my baby is losing it. A denarii is a, is a day wage for a laborer, right? So I made a little calculation, and I think it's 300 denarii would equate for a working year at that point, which is 40 more days in our working year right now. So on that basis, counting Arizona's minimum wage, that's $25,000 uh, if we just multiply the minimum wage by 300 days, then that's $30,000. So it's very expensive. So hold on a second, is Judas right? Isn't that wasted? Shouldn't that be used? Isn't there a better way to use that? My, my car's not worth that much. <laughs> and I don't even own it. <laughs> now, she uses this very expensive per perfume, and there's a lot of detail, detail about this perfume. Is a, this is a pound of it? It is expensive. It is made from pure nard, and the fragrance of it fills the whole house. Imagine using a whole bottle of perfume on one setting. <laughs> Reminds me of Mr. Bean when he goes through the department store, the perfume section. He's crawling and coughing, and and tells people not to go in there. <laughs> but presumably, that was nice. And then what else does she do? She uses her hair. She uses her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. Now, in our culture, that would be pretty crazy, okay? But we need to look at it in the context of Mary's culture. You see, slaves were the only one that touched feet. Feet were dirty. You wore sandals and you walked everywhere. It's not clean. Um, they're pretty gross. I mean, I think feet are the best of times. They're not the nicest part. But she's using her hair to wipe them. Later on, we see Jesus doing the same thing to the disciples, essentially. He washes all of their feet. And Peter is, feels uncomfortable because Peter sees Jesus as, as his teacher. And this is an incredibly humbling thing to do. The other thing is, women kept their hair covered. The fact that she loosens her hair to wipe Jesus' feet is also very significant. It's not unprecedented, but it's very significant. So what is Mary doing? Mary is showing gratitude and affection. I have certainly massage my wife's feet to show gratitude and affection. It's not something that I do all the time. But I think that's partly what she's doing. She's, she's, she's showing gratitude. She's showing affection. She, her, Jesus just raised her brother from the dead, who she was grieving and loved very much. You see, Mary's response to Jesus is that of devotion and worship. She gives something that is really valuable. Her family was likely rich to even own that. But she didn't use, she wasn't stingy. She didn't just do a gesture, a mild gesture. Like it outrages Judas because it's such a wasteful act. But it's not a wasteful act if you think about it. She humbles herself, puts herself at the feet of Jesus She's, it's, it's an act of worship and adoration. I like John Piper's definition of worship. It is, true worship is a valuing or treasuring of God above all things. She recognizes Jesus' significance. I believe she shows that she believes Jesus is being son of God. And she... She chooses to worship him. She chooses to adore him. It's a really extravagant, extravagant, really extravagant thing to do to grab a bottle of $30,000 perfume and anoint somebody with it. And it can seem crazy out of context or if misunderstood. But really... 
Last week, we looked at the infinite worth of Jesus, right? We looked at the incomprehensibleness of grace. Jesus' value is infinite. Mary doesn't know, but he's about to give his life. And and he's about to save the world from sin. In the context of that, does it seem like a big gesture? To me, it feels like the least that she could do. I mean, if my daughter died, I'd give 30,000. I'd give a kidney to have her raised from the dead. If my daughter was going to save the world, I'd give her a kidney just for like that, you know? Yeah, it's, just, it's just incomprehensible, the difference. And it makes you wonder, you know, is this how dear we hold Jesus? Is this how much we value him? See, Mary gave something precious. She humbled herself. She didn't hold back. Is this what we do? Is this what I do? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I have that level of devotion, but it's definitely what I want to aspire to. I think that her being here and her being remembered and recognized is to teach us that, to teach us the appropriate, appropriate level of devotion, how to value God above all things. And her devotion is recognized. She is remembered. We remember her. Her name is here. And there's a lot that we know about her, really. If you want to do a character study, and it's because of this act. When you want to have that level of praise, just have to worship Jesus. So Mary's response to Jesus is to worship him. But there's more. See, there's a hidden meaning, a deeper significance here. You see, though, I mentioned this before, but Gospel of John is about affirming Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the Son of God. And so Mary is anointing Jesus. Now, anointing is something associated with royalty. If we look at someone else that's important, higher up in the line of Jesus is King David. Samuel anointed King David. And from that point onward, Saul was threatened because that signified that David was going to be king. He was anointed, I believe, years before he was king, but it was, that was really God marking him to be king. This messianic symbolism, and Jesus accepts this. She doesn't rebuke, he doesn't rebuke her. He defends her. What we'll then find out in a few weeks, even though it's almost exactly after this passage, is that Jesus is about to triumphantly enter into Jerusalem, which is full of messianic symbolism. It's all tied in with him being king of the Jews, just not the king they expected, but it shows that she understood his role. Well, Judas misses it. Judah misses it because his attitude is wrong. His focus is wrong. He's not focused on Jesus. He's focused on the action. It's pretty tragic, really. See, Jesus being Messiah is what solicits Mary's worship, meaning that her worship implies his worthiness of worship. It implies his messianic role. Worship is what we're called to primarily. Everything else stems out of worship. And I, want, and I have a side note here about devotion. I believe that her devotion is the reason why God chooses her to be the anointer. I could be wrong, but I'm getting this feeling. Samuel 
was God's servant, dedicated to God when he was a child. And he went, he's one of the most important prophets. He's the one that anoints David. The one that God chooses to anoint David. And perhaps this is the same reason why Jesus, after his resurrection, appears first to the women that are early, going early to his tomb. They're showing devotion. I believe this is true. I believe this is true of Paul. I believe this is true of all the prophets. God uses them because of their devotion. God can use anybody. But if you want to be used, I think devotion is a good place to start. See, as we saw last week, God sent his only son as the ultimate act of love, as his incomprehensible act of grace. And both Mary and Judas heard Jesus' word, heard his teachings, were around him. They've seen the signs. Most likely, they were both there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And yet, only Mary responded in worship. Judas goes on to basically reject Jesus. He gets lost in his self-righteousness here. He gets lost in sin. You know, we sang, you know, I can't remember exactly the words, but don't give my soul to another. Well, that's what happens. If you don't worship Jesus, you're worshiping something else. Jesus did not say that the poor are not important. The poor are really important. He heals the poor. He cares for the poor. But worship comes first. Worship is the essential part of Christian life. It's not, I'm not saying worship just singing on a Sunday, but it's an attitude, a, a place where your heart is directed at God. That is worship. Putting God first, valuing God above all things. Believing Jesus is the Messiah. Believing in his work. Worship comes first. I have three t takeaways for you today that will hopefully tie in where I was going with this. The first one is the correct response to Jesus is worship. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. Jesus is the one that gave his life so that we may have a relationship with God and not perish in our sin. If that's not, if worship is not the at right answer, if adoration is not the right answer, then I don't know what is. An important thing to remember about this is that God sees the heart. That's how he chose King David. You know, with Samuel, he had, he, God instructed him that they, the king, the next king of Israel, the first king of Israel would come from this family. And all the brothers were sent before him. And the people were saying, surely this good looking man will be the king. Um, but no, he says, God does not look to appearance. He looks to the heart. Takeaway number two, worship comes first. Service to others, service to the poor, care of the poor, all flow out of worship. When we value God above all things, we value the things that God values. And number three, do not forget grace. Don't be like Judas. When you catch yourself judging others, when you catch yourself giving yourself a place of judge, which you do not have, do not deserve, and trust me, do not want, Remember grace. Remember the sacrifice. Remember the gift of grace. And redirect your energy in thanks and worship. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your teaching. Um, thank you that we can just reflect on it and gain wisdom from it. I pray that you 
Yeah, touch our hearts, give us new hearts, Lord, that are directed at worshiping you, that are correctly aligned with you. I pray that you keep us from temptation when we, when we are blessed with righteousness. Keep us from temptation to look down on others, to judge others. Keep us humble. Keep us worshipful. Keep our focus in adoring you. I pray this in Jesus' name.